Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two trusty co-hosts, Chris Dorides and Marissa Di Natale. Hi, guys. Hey, Mark. Good morning. Happy Friday. Happy Friday Happy to you. Happy Friday to you. Yeah. What's going on? Anything interesting? It's uh, cold in Philadelphia. I know. Uh, yeah. I'm looking out the window. I made my way back to Philly. You'll be happy to know. Did Just the uh, 15 hour trek with my uh, my wife and two dogs. We made our way up. Uh, 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 got caught in Washington D.C. traffic. Or otherwise, I would have had record record time. But uh, alas, you know, Washington messed me up. Really yeah. to that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, and I heard, Mercy, you're headed off to uh, Whistler. Is that like a ski I vacation a or what? Well, it is a business trip, but it's at the Four Seasons in Whistler. <gasps> so I'm turning it into Ooh. a little bit of a personal trip on the front end. That sounds nice. Yeah. yeah very good. Yeah. Somebody had been... to go. So I volunteered, <laughs> you know, someone had to fall on the sword. Uh, yeah, you drew yeah. the short straw. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. What do you fly into Vancouver and you drive? Yeah, up to and Whistler? then it's like a two hour drive north to Whistler. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't ski though, so this is sort of wasted on me. Well, I hope that I hope they have snow. You can report back next week. They do. They do apparently. Yeah. Good. Well, we have a guest. Uh, we already kind of teased her, Heidi uh, Shareholtz. Heidi, good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Well, you say that now. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Uh, Heidi's the uh, president of the uh, Economic Policy Institute, EPI. Uh, uh, welcome. I, I knew your predecessor, Larry Michelle, quite well. Larry, mm -hmm. is he retired or is he still? I see his tweets, actually. He's yep. still. He's uh, retired, but he's never he's technically retired, but technically. is just, you know, staying oh. in the game, yeah. <laughs> doing as much as he can. He's a, yeah. he's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, yeah, I remember I got to know him pretty well in the financial crisis back because mm -hmm. uh, he he held a lot of um, uh, meetings and informational uh, uh, that were there, there were no webinars back then, but we we had uh, uh, different convenings and that kind of thing to try to get a grip on what was going on. But uh, very very uh, good guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when did you become president of EPI? When did you take over from Larry? Two and a half. Well, you know what? There was a person in between. So oh, Thea there was. Lee was president for three and a half years, but then between Larry and me, but then she went into the Biden administration. She uh -huh. runs the international unit at the Department of Labor now. Got it. Um, and so I took over at EPI in the summer of 2021. So it's going, it's coming up on three years, mm -hmm. two and a half years, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I'm a longtime EPIer. I first joined EPI in 2007. So I have a, a rich history at the organization, but just have been running it for the last couple of years. And are, would you characterize yourself as a labor economist? Would that yeah. be fair? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Labor economist by training. Yep. Yeah. Right. And so you, you've been at EPI all in for how long? Did you say? Uh, well, I first came in 2007 and then 2007. I took what I always call like the most stressful sabbatical in the world. After in, in Not in the world, but in 2014, I went to be chief economist at the Department of Labor for two and a half years and then oh. came back to EPI. Um, oh, very cool. And then, you know, became the president after that. Got it. Got it. And you want to tell us a little bit about EPI? You know, what, what the, it's a think tank. Or I don't, is that? Is that okay to say you're thinking? Totally. Yes. Okay. I I think I, I I don't feel like anyone quite knows what a think tank is, but it's a reasonable description. We were formed in 1986, so we're a long running think tank. Um and the the core mission is to really bring the interests of low and middle income people into economic policy discussions, like mm. just to make sure that those voices are heard and that we understand um, just sort of shedding light on what really will create an economy that's both strong and agile and fast growing and fair, where productivity growth is broadly shared. That's a that's sort of our core, our core mission. And I don't know if if, if you appreciate this, but or maybe I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying, but I kind of think of think tanks kind of along the political spectrum. Do you do that as well? Is that fair to do? You know, like I think of like a Brookings kind of 
a little bit left of center. I think of American Enterprise Institute, AEI, a little right of center. Is is that fair? And where would you put yourself relative to those folks? I think it is fair. Um, I, you know, I always just think we look at the data. One thing that people will say about EPI is mm -hmm. no matter what you think about our last paragraph and mm -hmm. the conclusions that we draw from the data that we analyze, no one's taking issue with our analysis, right? Like mm -hmm. we do really rigorous work, mm -hmm. um, but then the conclusions will line up with a more progressive view of, you know, what, wow. what do we need to do to solve whatever problems have been that we've Focus. underlined with an analysis. Got it. And I know Josh, Josh, Josh Bivens pretty well. He's a uh, really good and talk about data mm -hmm. uh, dependent or oriented. He's he, he very data dependent. And actually in preparation for our conversation, I was reading a number of your blogs and other pieces and uh, chock full of data. You're going to be really good at this stats game later in the conversation. You got a lot of stats. Uh, how many people, how many, let's say how many scholars are there uh, for, if that's the right word, economists, scholars at uh, EPI? We have, that's a, I shouldn't have this off the top of my head. We have 50, roughly 50 people total and maybe Great. a total of eight economists. Got it. PhD Perfect. economists. And then there's others who are master's level analysts and those kinds of things who I will, would also say are scholar. I mean, I'm sure you will agree with me that a PhD in economics is neither necessary nor sufficient for doing good, high quality economic analysis. But yeah. um, we do have that stable of PhD economists. Got it. Well, it's great to have you. And we, there's a lot of topics to talk about. <clears throat> I want to talk about the immigrate. This is no order of importance, but immigration, because I know you've been writing about that a lot. That's been in the news, obviously, recently, given the surge in immigration and is it, is the consequences for lots of different things. Uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and what implications that might have for the labor market, income inequality, unionization. But I want to begin with the Fed, um, in uh, because this is top of mind. Uh, the Fed met this week, uh, had a meeting, reaffirmed uh, the federal funds rate target at 5.5%. And I thought maybe I'd just quickly turn to uh, Chris, and Chris, maybe just give give us a sense of, just some quick summary of what they did. Uh, and uh, your interpretation of uh, of the of the outcome of the meeting, the market certainly liked it. The stock market certainly liked it. Yeah, they uh, they met. They did not change the uh, Fed funds rate. That's the most mm -hmm. the direct actionable piece of things. Uh, and then there was the uh, the uh, the press conference uh, that uh, Chairman Powell held that I think mm -hmm. uh, provided that support for for the market. Um, my interpretation is kind of looking through. The uh, inflation data and that suggesting that three cuts are still on the table or cuts certainly this year are still on the table. There had been some uh, some analysts suggesting that that was no longer the case because of the inflation. So I think that was uh, supportive to the to the market uh, outlook. Yeah, you feel any better after all this? I mean, uh, about meaning where the because we've been kind of hand wringing yeah. a bit about the Fed waiting too long here and something breaking, and that's a potential risk to the economic uh, expansion. Uh, do you feel better after all this? I feel a bit better. A bit better. I think, uh, that, I mean, their outlook is, is similar to ours, right, with what we have in our, our forecast. But uh, I am still concerned. This is, you know, he's the chairman set the door open or left the door open uh, to additional cuts this year, but um, also suggesting you need to be data dependent. So I worry that the data can be misleading when we, as we've talked about in our previous podcast, the inflation mm -hmm. may not be quite as strong once you, uh, once you take out the uh, owner's equivalent rent uh, issue. And therefore we could have still, a, when the rubber hits the road, will they be willing to make the cut if the official inflation report is still suggesting you know, something around 3%, for example. So, Yeah, so, hi, just FYI, we've been, it feels like every podcast for the last four, five, six podcasts, each time <laughs> we dig deeper into the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and particularly the owner's equivalent rent, the cost of housing, which is, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, uh, quite problematic in terms of uh, how it's measured and, you know, what kind of impact that's having. Um, what should, uh, let me turn back to you, Heidi. What's kind of your take on what the fed's been doing what it did at the meeting mm -hmm. any and how are you feeling about things broadly one 
thing that I think is potentially useful to just mention, I'm sure you've talked about this, but um, there are just a lot of debates amongst economists about the correct neutral level of interest rates in the economy. But I think no one thinks that current rates are anywhere near neutral. So that's that we just know that to be true. But I think, and, and you're sort of hinting at this, the, the rate of inflation really is very close to neutral, a neutral rate right now, if not actually at it. So there's this real imbalance between the two. And I think that's that's that if it lasts much longer could get to be a real problem. It just puts a really stiff drag on growth. Um, one of the things I think about um, a, a sort of the impact that we really all have to worry about right now is I think the high interest rates are tough on the renewable renewable energy build out. So like that's that's a big problem. Um, and then to your point, like if they wait too long to raise, right right now we have a very, very, very strong economy, but if they wait too long to raise, it could start creating real weakness, even cause a recession. And that then has enormous problem. Like, you know, those are the kinds of things, that, that's what we want to avoid at, at really at all costs. And I, I think about, you know, I, I talked in the beginning that the mission of EPI is really to bring the interests of low and middle income people into economic policy discussions. And when you talk about a weak economy, like if if they wait too long to to reduce rates and that really does cause real weakness in the economy, that churns out inequity. Like weak economies churn out inequity. They churn out racial inequity they churn out inequity between low and low and middle income workers and higher income workers and that's because um, weak economies high unemployment they it really hits people across the board like all all across the wage distribution wage growth is slower when the unemployment rate is higher but it's worse the farther down the wage distribution you go. So high unemployment rates are worse for middle-income people than for high-income people. They're worse for low-income people than middle-income people. And so you really see weak economies, high unemployment, pulling apart um, pulling apart economic outcomes and and creating and, and generating real inequity. So there's this real sort of distributional problem that goes along with with waiting too long to lower rates as well. Yeah, I guess, and I am very sympathetic to what you said, but I guess if uh, you know, Fed officials probably wouldn't disagree with you. They would argue, though, that they want to make sure that the unemployment rate is low for as long as possible. You don't want to get the unemployment rate too low. Uh, inflation becomes a real problem. They got to jack up rates, and then you get a recession. That's not the kind of world we want. We want steady low unemployment like we've been getting for the last yeah. two years yeah. solid point i i yes that i absolutely agree with that and so the fact that we are seeing inflation just coming down looking very close to a, a sort of quote unquote neutral rate right now is the flip side of that like there's there's we're not we are seeing this steady decline in inflation and one thing that i think is potentially important um there was a pretty hot inflation print in January. Mm -hmm. um, and then the we don't have the February PCE numbers out yet. I, they should be coming out soon. But um, what we have the February uh, CPI numbers that, you know, it's showing, you know, it, it came mm -hmm. in better. It's you, There's a lot of reasons to believe that the January number was kind of a fluke. Um, and I think the, the steady, the pretty steady decline decline in inflation that we're seeing does and this big imbalance between the feds you know just with how high the interest rates are right now it does make me think that we we're kind of moving to if, we're, if we are not at the point where the evidence is strong enough that inflation is normalizing that the fed needs to kind of start ignoring one month pops of hot inflation data like not change course because you get one hot January. Like I I think we that's one one key thing that I, I think the broader trends are showing us. Totally, totally. And I think, you know, I I got the sense listening to Powell that 
he thought that the January and to a lesser degree, the February consumer price inflation numbers, they were, as you said, hot. They came in strong, probably were uh, affected by data issues, seasonal adjustment, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I took some souls in that. Hey, Marissa, anything you want to add on the conversation on the Fed before we move on? Um, I, you know, he, he kept reiterating that they're um, committed to bringing inflation back down to 2%, but he seemed to acknowledge he was asked a question about shelter inflation, for example, and he acknowledged that they're looking at that data. They know there's a lag in it, that inflation is on the right trajectory. It's been a bumpy few months, so they're being cautious. So he seems to, I don't know, I interpret it as that he's kind of, he is looking through some of that noise, um, you know, and they are acknowledging some of these quirks in the data. So I don't think that they necessarily need to see inflation at 2% before they do anything. I think he just wants to know that, you know, we need another couple readings on inflation. As long as it's moving lower or it's not moving higher, you know, I think then they're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I did notice, which I found interesting, going back to your point, Heidi, about the uh, neutral rate, the so-called equilibrium rate, that rate which oh. where monetary policy is neither supporting nor restraining growth, they raised it just to, I don't know if you noticed, they in the summary of economic projections, so-called SEP, they they release that every quarter. These are their forecasts. And in that, they have a long run forecast and for the federal funds rate target. And they they raised it just a tick from 2.5% to 2.6, which is the their estimate of the neutral rate, which seems very low to me, you know, in the current context. That, you know, feels like in our forecast we have it at somewhere around three and that even feels low i've you know and i've talked to a number of economists who think it's even higher than that but but to your earlier point regardless of where you think that is it's not five and a half right. five and a half is a lot higher than yeah than, than three. anyone's estimate yeah, anyone's right. estimate yeah. right so okay um okay let's uh let's move on and uh uh heidi um i want to just kind of frame it this way i'm just really curious so when I read your work and the work that comes out of EPI, you know, I get the sense, and you feel free to push back, you know, because I'm just this is this is just in Zandy's mind, you know, you know, I'm, how I think about it. You you kind of frame things, uh, all the research you do and the work you do, you kind of frame it in this. Um, I don't know if battle is the right word, but this tension that exists between workers and employers, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, here, here's some data that I'm just curious how you think about this. So when I think about this tension between workers and um, uh, employers, I, I go to uh, national income and I look at where the national income is going. National income is the economic pie. You know, GDP is the value of the things that we produce that generates income, uh, wages, that in, uh, profits and other sources of income. And we divide that pie up, and, and labor's share of that, and you can see the you know the amount that goes towards compensation, which is wages, salaries, and benefits, is you know you can look at the data back to 1947, right after World War II. The the average share uh, is I was going to use this for my stat game, but I I, I just can't wait to, to say it, so I'm going to use it. 63.8 percent. That that is the average through. Uh, time back to 1947. The last data point we have is for the fourth quarter of 2023, and the share is 63.8 percent. It goes up, it goes down. You know, it, it has obviously been higher back in the 80s, early 90s. It was close to two thirds, maybe even a little higher than that at points in time, because it is cyclical. It goes up and down based on what's going on in the business cycle. To your point about unemployment, uh, but you know, it's kind of roughly where it's always been. So. Yeah, is that is that that? What do you think of that data? What do you think about the, what I just said? Do I have this right? I mean, in, in my if you look at that, take it at face value, you'd say, you know, it's a draw uh, between this this the, this this battle or this tension that exists between workers and 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 their employers. No. Uh so one thing that the labor share sidesteps entirely. Okay is inequality within income. Like that's, I think, of if you look at rising inequality over the last four and a half decades, the, the lion's share of it has not come from decreasing labor share. Um, although if you look like since 2000, you, you do see decreasing labor share over that period. 
but um the lion's share of it has been like it, very strong rising inequality within wages for example within within income so that's really the source of it that's where it's coming from and so that is masked entirely when you look just at the overall labor share those are the things where you see you know the if you just look at inequality within earnings that the top 1% just skyrocketing the top 5% skyrocketing, but a little bit less the top 10%, you know, like just that kind of fractal kind of inequality. Though one interesting thing is that was, that's been true basically um, from, you know, mm -hmm. 1970. I think of the, the sort of the, the real spurt of this rise in inequality starting with the, you know, the, the early eighties. Um, if you look from 79 to 2019, you see this rise in inequality within income. Um, that's not been true over the last four years. If you look from 2019 to 2023, the pattern is the opposite of what we had been seeing over that period where you saw the strongest real wage growth in the bottom, like it was, it's exactly the opposite graph. You see the, mm -hmm. the strongest real wage growth at the very bottom, the next strongest real wage growth at the lower middle and on and on and on and the lowest real wage growth at the very top. So we have seen a little bit of a reversal in the last, you know, over the pandemic period. And we can talk about, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but there's, it in no way has undone the, the, massive amounts of rising inequality that happened in the 40 years prior to that. But that's where the meat of the rising inequality is. Okay. I, I got it. So it's not really a worker versus employer. It's, it's that, uh, you know, if you look at the income of uh, workers of individuals, it's become more skewed over time that the folks in the top part of the distribution are taking a higher share of that income, uh, of that, uh, of that, uh, the, the, they're, they're getting, workers are getting their share of the national, of national income that, that, that goes up and down all around, but it hasn't really changed much, but the distribution of where that share is going is, has become more skewed. That's what you're focused on. That is absolutely right. And when you think of, I do think that this question of power in the, I mean, your, your point about tension, I think, you know, economists might not have used the word, well, the people, Economists definitely use the word power, um, but mm -hmm. that's been the focus of you know who has leverage and um, has is the focus of a huge amount of economic research and theory. Um, but it is in this case, in it's in instead of the the sort of fruits of productivity growth going to capital, is the shift has been less to capital and more to like um executive pay and pay of and other highly paid professionals like it's 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 it that's where we're seeing the big increases okay okay got it um and uh uh I was going to say one other thing oh uh, when i look at uh trying to quickly measure income inequality i immediately go to the gini coefficient and the you know that's the way of measuring what percent of the of income is going to uh, uh, to 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 low income groups up to high income groups. Uh, just for context, uh, uh, if the Gini coefficient is uh, zero, then that's uh, that's a, a perfect equality, and if it's one, it's it's uh, perfect inequality. And right now, and the census publishes this every year with a bit of a lag. Uh, right now, it's sitting. Uh, 0.49, something like that, you know, kind of uh, halfway in between. That is well up from, say, 1980. So from 1980 through 1990, 1995, it rose very sharply, 0.40 in 1980. I'm speaking from memory, so I don't have it exactly right, but this is roughly right. 0.40 in 1980 to, say, 0.45, 0.46 by the early uh, 1990s. It's kind of meandered up uh, a little bit through the financial crisis. And since the financial crisis, more or less, it has not changed. And as you said, most recently, it feels like it's come in a little bit, although mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that's just cyclical because the economy is strong or whether there's something more fundamental going. But the, the broader point is most of the, by that measure, and the question is going to be, is that a good measure? But by that measure, 
the, most of the skewing of the income and wealth distribution occurred in the 80s, uh, kind of the first part of the 1990s. Since, uh, since then, it's been pretty modest in the last decade, not so much. Is that, is that fair characterization? So that's a, this is a really interesting point. I almost never look at the Gini oh, coefficient, okay. but it, not that it's bad. I just feel like I don't, I don't feel like people have a benchmark in their head for what it quote unquote should be. Mm. And the, it doesn't give you information about how, as you see changes in inequality, it doesn't tell you the nature of that. Like it's, so I like to look at like the, the 50, 10, okay. um, ratio, which it would just be like the ratio of the, the median, the, the person at the middle, their wages to the 10th percentile wages. So you get a sense of what's going on with inequality at the bottom and then look at the 90, 50 to get a sense of what's going on with inequality at the top. I like to look at those because I just feel like they they provide more texture. But um, the, I think that this... I. I uh, so do, is the data the way I characterize it consistent with kind of the way you think about it using it, these other measures of income and quality that, you know, it's really the skewing really was most pronounced in the 80s, early 90s, since then somewhat, but not nearly to the same degree in the last decade or so, not so much. Is that fair or is that in your mind's eye kind of how you see things? That is, oh my gosh, now this is the minute I get off of this podcast, I'm going to <laughs> run to look at the, the sort yeah, of decade yeah, yeah. by decade yeah. trend because I don't have them in my head. You're, okay, yeah. so- one thing we know is there was has been a reversal since two th you know if you yeah. since the business cycle that started in 2019 and your point is we're still in that we have to see how that is going to play out, out. Yeah. um so but if you look before that we still saw like the the business cycle from 2007 to 2019 was just it had the weakest, one of the weakest recoveries, if not the weakest, slowest recovery on record. There's a, you know, there's a lot of, that was, I, separately, that was a policy choice. It didn't have to be that way. We did not do the the fiscal policy that would have created a strong recovery in that following the Great Recession, like we have following the COVID recession. Um, but so I, I just, I know that what that does what the, that kind of weak recovery does is really increase inequality. So I, it's I have to look back, but um, I think we have seen pretty steady rising inequality in the mm -hmm. the measures that I focus on the most over that period. But I'm definitely gonna look. And we did see like in the late '90s, we saw improvements with the very strong mm -hmm. labor market of the late '90s. So it definitely isn't. Um, it, it isn't some kind of monotonically rising inequality over that period. Well, but okay, you so have maybe want to go yeah. look. Let's stipulate that the the, the income and in, and in, we haven't talked about wealth, but certainly wealth is much more skewed today yeah. than it was forty to fifty years ago, and it much of that happened early on in the period, but and it's still happening to some degree, but less so. so you know, debate as to to what degree. Uh, but before we move on, because I what I want to do is. Uh, kind of dig into the reasons for this and what that means about as, things as we look forward. And we're going to talk about, you know, immigration, um, you know, AI technology more broadly, unionization, uh, you know, uh, forces. And I, I've got a couple of other theories I'd like to bounce off you if we've got time too, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, income and wealth inequality that I think might be interesting. But before we do that, let me uh, turn back to uh, Marissa and Chris. You've been hearing this discussion around how to measure income inequality and the, the way things have been framed so far. What do you think? Anything to add there, Marissa? Anything to add or to anything you want to say? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in when, Heidi, when you were talking about the late 1990s, early 2000s, right? I mean, that was the arguably the best run in the labor market we've had in in recent history and was in part spurred by the internet, right? So now we're facing down the possibility of AI, which I know we're gonna talk about. So I am very curious to hear your thoughts on what that might mean for all of these things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Chris, anything? I guess a, a question I'll ask, I think this is probably on the minds of the, some of the listeners yeah. right now is uh, when you're running down the uh, income inequality statistics, is that gross income? or net of trans transfers. That's always the, 
a subject mm -hmm. of debate. Right? Mm -hmm. Are you just talking about income, earned wage income, and what that distribution looks like? Or are you accounting for taxes as well as transfer payments? Yeah, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I tend to focus, just there's so much to focus on, like yeah. just making a choice of, um, I tend to focus on pre-tax and transfer income just because I'm interested in what the market is delivering for working people as a, as a, as a sort of a, a core interest. Um, but the trends aren't massively different. If you look at, we just, we have a very well targeted, like transfer system in the sense that it's you know it it does it 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 helps the people that it gets to but it's very small and so it doesn't have a huge impact um on the overall trends but it's not nothing and that's a really good question it's a really good point i mean um okay well like most most everything it boils down to how it how you measure it yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes yeah but in this case i'm pretty sure no matter how you measure it uh income and wealth uh, has become more unequal over the last 40 50 years i, I don't i don't yeah. i don't know that there's certainly much wealth yeah. yeah certainly and certainly a question wealth. of degree right the question of degree and, to, and 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 also more recently to what degree has it the skewing become less pronounced or has has not increased to the same degree you know that kind of thing okay why don't we do this before we dive into immigration ai unionization let's play the game cuz this is pretty dense already <laughs> the conversation was pretty dense uh and uh, the stats game is we each put forward a stat uh, the rest of the group tries to figure that out with clues and questions deductive reasoning the best stat is one that's not so easy we get it immediately one that's not so hard we never get it and if it's apropos to the topic at hand uh, uh income and wealth inequality and and this uh, those issues uh the, the better uh so we uh Heidi, we always start with marissa it's tradition. So we're going to start with Marissa. We don't know we'll get, why, but we'll we'll we do. <laughs> yeah. And Marissa's pretty good at this game. I'd say really good at this game. So uh, uh, watch out for her. Okay. I yeah. I really, Heidi, in honor of you, I really wanted to pick a labor mar market statistic because I also am a labor economist and worked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics before oh, I came to. So was Heidi but, your boss, Marissa? Is that possible? I don't know. No, no, not, no. Oh, okay. Um. I was there a long, long time ago, but I, I, but I want, but then I thought if I picked a labor statistic, I wouldn't have any chance of stumping you. So I'm going in a different direction. Okay. My statistic is 17 years and one month. 17 years and one month in, does it have to do with income and wealth inequality? No, it doesn't. Oh, so it's totally unrelated. It is. Yeah. Okay. Is it labor market related at all? No. No. Okay. And wow. is it a stat that just came out this week? Yes. Why, like I, you know, why do you say it this, that way? Either it the, did or it didn't. It. Yes, it did. Okay. It, 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 okay. This, this calculation <laughs> See was how made she does this? Heidi? Yes, she's good yeah. at it. I'm yeah. really this. good at this. Yeah. The intonation, like she puts <laughs> yeah. doubt in your mind. Like, Okay. That, okay, this week is it uh, a record high it, of something? It is a no. It's not. Or, let Let me give you. I thought you guys were going to get this right away. I'm. Well, hold on. Can I? Is it is, is something to do with housing and being able to afford a home? No. Okay. All right. Go ahead. It is Here's related to. It is related to monetary policy. So back to our original discussion. Oh. Oh. Mo monetary policy. Seventeen. Would you say seventeen years and what? And one, one month. month. Uh, it, uh, it, do I have to do? Is it something that happened seventeen years ago? Seventeen point seventeen years and one month ago. Yes. Oh, okay. the last. Okay. Yeah. The, so it's yeah, the, the last, last time, time the happened, Fed did. The something. last time this happened was seventeen years and one month ago. Okay, okay. I'm doing the. Yeah, the arithmetic. That would be two thousand and seven. Two thousand and seven. Yeah. And uh, oh. the last time the Fed kept the funds rate at its terminal rate, no, okay, because <laughs> 2007. That's no, that's the right before the financial crisis, right? Uh, well, did we get? Is it 2007? Yeah, it has to be, right? Yeah. Yes. 
uh, what happened? 2007 was right before the crisis. The funds rate was sitting at, was it sitting at five and a half percent? Yeah. No. Uh, come on, Chris, you gotta, you gotta chime <laughs> in, man. <laughs> so wait, this is March, 2007. Is that the, is March, 2007, the, 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 February. Benchmark February, February, 2007. February. Okay, one month. Yeah. It does, okay, yeah. okay, this is great. So, oh, what right. happened <laughs> February of 2007? February 2007. Okay, uh, uh, February 2007. Something the Fed did in February of 2007. Is that right? That right, Marissa? No, no. It, not the Fed. Oh, not the Fed. Uh, not the Fed. I thought she said the something Fed. Congress did in February. I didn't say the Fed. I said it has something to do with monetary policy. Oh right. Oh, oh. right. Oh jeez. Oh wow. I don't. Know. I I don't. Know. Heidi, uh, I, I give. What do you? I, I don't know. I I yeah. I want to like call a friend. I don't know. Yeah right. It's going to be something we should have said. Oh, we you know we should have known that. But yeah you know, yeah. Go ahead, Marissa. What is it? This was the last time the Bank of Japan raised oh, interest rates. So the Bank course. of the of Bank course. of Japan just ended its yes. 17 year policy of negative interest rates this week. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a good one, but totally unrelated to anything, Marissa. I'm just saying. We had some discussion <laughs> about <laughs> You had that Fed comment in there that yeah, you know, yeah. See how she put does us off that. the path. Yeah, yeah we talked about yeah. interest rates and monetary policy. It's not unrelated. No, that's a good one, though. That's no, no, actually a very good one. It is so, related. quickly explain what happened. What did, what did BOJ do? The Bank of Japan raised its short term, basically overnight deposit rate earlier this week to just above zero, a range that's just above zero. The Bank of Japan had had a policy of negative interest rates. Uh, on deposits for the past 17 years. So they've been trying to stimulate the economy by actually making depositors pay banks to keep money uh, in, in accounts and banks. And they also, with this announcement, ended a bunch of other things, control over the the bond, they still have control over the Japanese bond market, but they ended investment in things like REITs and exchange traded funds and a bunch of other things to try to stimulate the Japanese economy. I mean, it's interesting because Japan, the, the reason that they did this is because, of course, Japan had been in mired in extremely slow growth, slow pro productivity growth, deflation for years. But now the Japanese economy is actually inflating even a little bit above the BOJ's target. It's, it's inflating at over 2% year over year. And the sort of catalyst for this is that there was a very large negotiation of Japan's largest labor union that affects millions and millions of workers. They got the largest wage increase of over 5% that they've, oh, okay, I can bring this back to the topic at hand to hide. Okay, good. They got the, the, <laughs> the largest wage increase that they've gotten since 1991. Right. And so the bank believes this will be inflationary for the economy. Uh, the economy is weak, though, you know, so this is this is a bit of a controversial move because it's not as if the Japanese economy is growing quickly or even, you know, uh, inflating that much. Right. Uh, so they they did this, but they also cautioned that we're not so keen to keep raising policy rates. We're going to be really cautious and we're going to go really slow with this because we recognize the economy sort of teetering on the brink of recession. And like the Fed and many other central banks around the world, they're kind of treading this line between taming inflation, but not wanting to stall the economy's growth. Yeah, that's a really good one. I mean, it's the only major central bank, maybe the only central bank that's raising interest rates. So you know, yeah. everyone else is getting ready to cut, but that's a great one. Heidi, you want to go next? Well, I was going to do something that is a topic that we'll discuss l after okay. this, but should okay. I still go for it? Should I yeah, give go you a rough yeah, topic? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. go ahead. I have t I'm just debating between two different ones, but I will one. just go with, because it's round number 75%, and it has to do with unions. I'll just- 75%, it has to do with unions. Uh, well, think of, um, uh, well, I'll let you ask questions before I, I can give hints. 
okay, that's a, a percent of some group that is unionized. No, no, that would be really no, high. right? Yeah. That would be high, right? Because is you, it a percent of a group that wants to be unionized? No. Oh, but is that closer? That's Beltline it is closer. getting closer as far as like people's right. think thoughts thoughts about something. Okay. Right, right. Uh, it's people's I'll, thoughts about something, not actual. Oh, right. People who approve percent of the population that approve of unions. Okay, that is very very close. Okay, so okay. that is very very close. But you could say, Mark, you got it right. You could say that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is very very close. It is, and that's the other one I was going to do. But it is. Um, think of stick with that thinking, but yeah. then think of major union actions that got a lot of coverage. Oh, you mean Last the uh, UAW? The auto right? strike? Oh, or the uh, writer strike. First the, one. Oh, the auto UAW strike. strike. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so 75% of uh, of people felt positively about what the UAW did when they struck uh, the automakers. That's right. Right. Oh, The cool. share of people, the share of Americans who like That's sided with the UAW in their labor dispute with the yeah. U.S. auto companies. Right. Is that, is that like a, uh, like a Gallup, like Gallup, yeah. Gallup poll? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, that's good. Is, so is your, what's your broader point? Is it that people are, cause is it my, again, this is just in my mind's eye. People have historically kind of looked at in recent history, not all time history, but in recent history have looked with a jaundiced eye on unions, but that's... that may be changing. That is exactly my point, that we are in this period of just incredibly broad support for unions, uh, people reporting that they think that reporting that unions are good for the economy, that unions should be stronger, that, you know, like we're at near record highs for union approval, the broad union approval that I didn't go with, but is very close to these numbers. Um, it's just a very, very different environment than where we, you know, those numbers weren't anything like that in, in the more recent past. So it, it's, it's a big, it's a big shift. Let's just dwell on that for a second and we'll come back. But why do you think this uh, perception is changing? What, what's it's going a, on? Yeah, I, it's a, that is, I feel like there'll be lots of dissertations written about that. I think one of the things that is like the, like the, 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 incredibly large support for the striking UAW workers. I just, nothing is polling in the U.S. at 75% now, no. like nothing. It is just remarkable that, that this is, that there is this, this sort of unity around unions. I think it, um, working people, even though we have this very, we have a very strong mm -hmm. economy, growing real wages, you know, unemployment at less than 4% for more than two years now, the, all of those things are remarkable, but we still have a huge share of people that are, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, they're really struggling. And I think um, what we have seen in the recession in particular and post COVID in particular is that unions were kind of standing up and demanding things and have people have seen unions get wins for their workers and i and i think it's really struck a chord i think that i i it's a good it's a good question i think the very tight labor markets have were one of the things that sort of spurred that process um and then it has been something of momentum momentum building upon itself where there have been some important wins and people have seen that there is you know there i feel like there's been some of the relearning of the lessons of you know joining together with your coworkers actually gives you power to to secure some demands um that i i think had had been kind of those lessons had been kind of unlearned in the prior 40 years and what? sorry i'll just oh i'll just say one more thing Sure. We, we do have such low unionization rates in this country mm, after four right. decades of like relentless attacks on unions um, that there's a very small share of people in our economy that actually grew up in a union household or have any like direct experience with unionization. And I think that's one of the things that that 
that facilitated those lessons of the power in joining together with your coworkers that facilitated those lessons being lost, um, that the tight labor markets leading to worker actions and some wins and generating momentum has has sort of shifted in this in the in the post pandemic, not that we're post pandemic, but in the since the COVID era began. Hmm, interesting. I wonder, uh, just throwing it out there that the high inflation may also be playing a role because people yeah. view the inflation as a ripoff. And to some degree, yeah. you know, if you look at profit margins of companies, yep. they've gapped out during the pandemic, meaning they've raised their prices much more significantly than the cost of labor and other input. And the margins are no longer rising. They're starting to come in, as you would expect, as competition kicks in in lots of different industries. But people are paying higher prices for everything. Mm -hmm. and they're saying you know, this, and they haven't seen this before. You know, in many of them in their lifetime, and this, they view this as it's just unfair. It's just a ripoff, and maybe a union is a way to get you know the higher wages necessary to you know fight back and maintain purchasing power. Just, a, just think, a thought. Yeah. No, I I am sure that that has a part of it. And it's really hard to parse out like what are the different, um, what are different causes of it. But I that has to be playing a role. That just has to be playing a role. Well, here while we're on the topic, before we move on to Chris and his stat, while we're on unionization, we might as well play this out. The one I've done a lot of you know fair amount of modeling of. Uh, trying to understand what's been dry, what has driven the skewing of income and wealth distribution. And, you know, there's a lot of measurement issues that Chris brought up and lots of other things that go on. But the one thing that in every model I built, I mean, every single one of them is share of the labor force that's unionized. That is like critical uh, to uh, explaining, you know, what's going on. And it's been steadily declining. I, I think it, it kind of the, the symbolic, uh, event was when Ronald Reagan broke the uh, air traffic union. Yep. I think that was 1979 or 1980, wasn't it? Somewhere in there. But it might have been in 79 or something because wasn't Carter. No, was it? Was yeah, it would have had happened? to have been in 80, yeah. right? Because he yeah. came in. Was it? Was it? Oh, it was Office. 80. Yeah, it was 1980. 80. This yeah, is 1980. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 1980. And, and uh, since then, that's when the skewing of income and wealth inequality became, you know, much more pronounced. So when the, when unions really started to fall off as a share of the, of the labor force. Um, but is, I, I'm sure that conforms with your thinking that, that the unionization is uh, what, what, one of the, one of the key critical reasons why income and wealth inequality has become more skewed is the decline in the labor force that's unionized. Yep. It's absolutely, I mean, union unions, People who are in unions get higher wages, better benefits than similar workers who aren't in unions. Like if you take into account age, experience, education, occupation, blah, blah, all the things, there is a union premium. You get paid more if you're in a union. But then at least as big an, of an effect is the union spillover effect that when unions are strong, they actually help self set standards more broadly in the economy. And as union density goes down, that spillover effect just weakens because there's less, you know, your your employer, there's 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 sort of less if if that that spillover effect is because uh, non-union employers are like, well, I better pay decent wages or my company might unionize and I don't really want that to happen. Um, if the union density is really low, that threat becomes a lot less real. Um, but we did like with the UAW um strikes, we saw that spillover effect just playing out in real time. The the wages of Hyundai, Honda, um, oh my gosh, there's Toyota, and now there's more, but got raises. The workers at those at those unions got raises. They did not strike. They are not even unionized, but they got raises like five minutes after the successful strikes mm. at GM, Ford, and Stellantis. And that's just like that's the union spillover effect just right there. So that both of those dynamics contribute together to the decline of unionization having played a real role in the increase in inequality. And then I will also just say the other big thing that when we when we look at the at the um at you know what has driven the rise in inequality, the two big there's others, but two big ones are the decline of unionization and too high unemployment, like too high mm, unemployment sure. for much of that period 
just causes inequality. And can I just say one more thing on this? Because we haven't talked about race much in this discussion, mm -hmm. but one thing that I think is not well understood um, is like, I think most people think, oh, well, the black white wage gap, it may not be improving as quickly as we'd like it to, but it must be better now than it was 45 years ago, right? It is not. The black-white wage gap has is worse now than it was in 1979. And one of the it, it has improved over this, you know, the the 19 or 2019 to 2023 period when things have gotten better, but it is still worse than it was in 1979. And I think the decline of unionization is a is a core part of that because the the union premium is higher for black workers than it is for white workers. Um, there, and there's lots of reasons for that, but black workers are more likely to be in unions than white workers. So unions actually are, are a, a key um, force to reduce the black white wage gap. And so as they, as unions density has gone down, we've it's coincided with black white wage gap rising. Hmm, interesting. Well, uh, I do want to move on to Chris, but since we're kind of on the topic, um, of reasons for the skewing of the income and wealth inequality, and you kind of sort of mentioned it, was the, the persistently high unemployment mm -hmm, that existed mm -hmm. in periods. Here's a th theory I want to throw out and get your take on, and this goes back to monetary policy, and that is, you know, from uh, the late 70s, really when Paul Volcker became chair of the Fed, through Alan Greenspan up until Bernanke, Inflation was high, and the Fed's goal in life was to get that back down, to, to get inflation back down, get inflation expectations back down, tethered. And the way the Fed did that was by running a policy that Alan Greenspan dubbed as opportunistic disinflation, which meant run a soft economy, run an economy with you know persistently higher unemployment that's higher than the full employment unemployment rate so that you get wage growth moderating and get inflation back in the bottle. And it, and it, you know, it worked, but one of the casualties of that policy, and I'm not saying I, I had a better idea how I would do that, but it's, I'm just trying to explain why in the 80s and in particularly in the 90s, we saw this very significant skewing is because we had, you know, this policy of, of persistently high unemployment opportunistic disinflation to get inflation back in the bottle. Does that, does that resonate with you, that, that theory, uh, Heidi? Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Although when you look, if you look at um, inflation and the Fed's target, it you see a big, it used to be like pre-79, you saw, you know, sometimes they'd miss it on the high side, sometimes they'd miss it on the low side. So it really looked like a target. And then you move into an era where they're just consistently missing it on the low side, like inflation mm -hmm. actually lower than their target. And this is, I think this is kind of what you're like, that's, in in other words, having full employment be the casualty there and working people really pay the price for that. Mm, interesting. Okay, Chris, what? and we'll come back because we've got to go through all the different other factors uh, driving all this. But Chris, what's your stat? Okay, I'm going to go a little off of the uh, topic here. I guess it indirectly relates to inflation, monetary policy, but very indirectly. The stat is 644,000. The housing stat? It is. There's it's, a lot of good housing data this week. Yeah, it's, she it's, is good at this game. New, it's not new home sales, is it? Because it's nope. that's a it's that's around that number, but but that would be too too easy, I think. No, no. Um, is it a sales number? Nope. Is, is it, it a start construction, construction number? Yeah, it is home. a construction number. Okay. Uh, single family or multi family? Single family? Nope. Multi family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It can't be, it's not complete, it's not in the pipeline because that's about a million units. Permits? No, oh, you you almost said it, Mark. It's not it's not no. in the pipeline. Completion. It's not at the start of the pipeline. Completion. Oh, oh somewhere in the pipeline is it's going to completion. It's at the end of the pipeline. Oh, it's completion. It's 644. <laughs> okay, it's completion. Okay. Got it. Got it. Uh, which is a high number. Okay. It's a very high number. Yeah. It's uh, 20. 1% increase over the month, wow. right? 19% uh, increase over the year, right? So it's a very high number. It's uh, actually, I, lo I looked, uh, it's the highest single month level of uh, multifamily completion, completion since 1986, right? So it's, wow. it's right. really high. 
Can we tell uh, Chris high end, low end, affordable? What is it? Do we can we tell? I can't tell in this uh, in this release specifically, mm -hmm. but other data still suggests that most of the construction continues to be at the at the high end. Right. 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 So Which, these are these yeah. are luxury apartments in the you know big towers going up in DC or Chicago or LA. Yeah, or even in suburban areas, they yeah, may okay. be more geared towards the higher end of that market than right. the lower end, just because you know, we've, well, we've talked about zoning and other things uh, to death, right. but uh, that still yeah. is the, the skew. So yeah, not as, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say in terms of, you know, it's still not, not great in terms of affordability. You're not targeting the group that needs the housing the most, but still there is a, a cascading effect, right? If you're providing more housing at that higher end, presumably you're going to have folks moving out of other properties into those units, bringing up, you know, if the cascade works, uh, some uh, some additional housing throughout the spectrum. So another reason perhaps to expect that rent growth may not be uh, accelerating anytime soon. We are adding a lot of units uh, to the housing market. So that's certainly a positive when it comes to keeping inflation down should support that uh, that Fed rate cut in uh, in June. Yeah, one of the most fascinating things and I, this just shows how weird I am because I think this is fascinating. But yeah. uh, the level of of housing construction is extraordinarily high. There's only been one other period in history in the in the kind of tax juiced 1980s that the the amount of homes we're actually putting up has been higher. I mean, we've got this severe hmm. shortage of home uh, of, of affordable homes. The vacancy rates are very low, but. That's in the context of this um, really pretty yeah. impressive amount of supply coming into the market, right? It's just pretty amazing. And that's one reason why the economy's held up as well as it has in the face of higher interest rates, because the one sector that gets crushed when rates go up is con single family, multifamily construction. And that, that has it's, not happened. Just the opposite. Just yeah. the opposite. Yeah. They're pretty interesting. It has uh, been. I, you know, that also makes me think of like manufacturing construction has also gone yeah, through the roof. Yeah, like the, yeah. the thing that high interest rates usually hit and is another version of that. The things totally. that it, high interest rates usually hit just haven't taken the hit. I mean, the, the manufacturing construction is the result of the industrial policy bills coming out. And but um, it's it is it, it is one of the reasons I think that the high interest the high interest rates just haven't hurt the economy and, as much and, as they otherwise know. would have. Right. Okay. So going back to income and wealth inequality, uh, we've identified a number of uh, some factors at work here that have resulted in the skewing. We focused on unionization. We talked a little bit about the high, I, I couched the kind of the perennially high unemployment to monetary mm -hmm. policy and just the effort to get inflation back in the bottle. The other two, and there are probably more, and I'm going to ask, but the other two explanations for the rise in income inequality that you often hear is around technology mm -hmm. and the fact that that kind of hollows out and takes a lot of jobs from low income folks and, you know, enhances the marketability and the pay and the, and the uh, compensation of folks that have the skills that can take advantage of the technology. And, and the other is globalization. And that has a number of different facets to it, trade being part of it, but also immigration. Uh, Heidi, any other major factor that you would put forward? And then I want maybe two questions. One, any other factor? And could you just rank or in your mind, rank order, you know, those factors in terms of uh, driving the increase in income inequality over the past 40, 50 years? If, if that's a fair question. Yeah, it is definitely a fair question. I um the other sort of bucket of things I would add mm -hmm. is the weakening of labor standards. So like, you know, the minimum wage hasn't been raised, mm -hmm. federal minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2009. The um the enforcement of la labor standards we do have has has gone down 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 so wage theft is a high is a is a you know a billions of dollar game every year. So that those that sort of um, labor standards bucket is also a, a really key thing. And then maybe we'll just throw it into the labor standards bucket. There's this rising trend of workers just being forced to sign away their rights as a condition of employment with like oh, right. widespread non-compete agreements right. and forced arbitration agreements. And all of that is like a, a way to kind of shift power from workers to their employers, or as we talked about, to the to working people to very highly paid people within firms. Um, 
So, okay. But ranking those things, I think key, the key ones are too high unemployment for much of this period and mm -hmm. declining unionization, mm -hmm. those. And then I think um, the inequality being caused by technology is at essentially zero. I actually, oh, do, I can right? talk about why, but I do not think that that's a big, oh, a big part of this story at all. And I could talk about why mm. um, globalization is a core part of it. Um, the, the, and you know, the way globalization itself isn't a problem, the way we have done globalization yeah. has increased inequality in the U S um, and then this weakening of labor standards is also, and their enforcement is also, I think a, a core part of it. So, so just, just, just to get it summarized, top of the list would be unionization. Second would be kind of this perennial, this period of high unemployment to get inflation yeah, back. Yeah, those might be reversed. Like maybe might it's be reversed. too high okay. unemployment, but they're okay. close. Those are, yeah. I would, yeah, I think our our data actually show um, too high unemployment is the number one. And number, then, okay. And okay. then unemployment, and then sorry, declining unionization is the, is the other real biggie in the, Okay, and then and then uh, globalization, kind of broadly defined, I trade think, mostly. Yeah, yeah. And 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 then followed by, well, labor standards and that that, that kind of uh, melange of stuff. Of things. Yeah, yeah. And then at the very bottom, not even on the list, you said is technology. Not really? And okay, explain think, that one to me. Okay, okay. okay. And I also think immigration just isn't really a isn't really a player in in, in, in immigration is not either. So when you say globalization, it's, you mean trade? And oh yes, that trade. solid point. I do. I I don't think immigration is a big contributor at all. It's not zero, but it's not a big oh, contributor. Um, uh, the um one reason for that is you know there's a lot of immigrants that come in on both sides like very high wage very low wage so they may mechanically raise raise inequality because they come in very skewed um but it's i don't think it's generating inequality within the like native born population or us born population okay but moving on to um technology. So this this like idea of skill bias technological change has really, you know, captured the imagination of economists for a very long time as a key cause as a key cause of rising inequality, but I don't think it when you really dig in, it mm. doesn't play out. It you don't see it in the data. And one mm. one I'm going to just try to describe a scatter plot here, but it is it is simple one. Like the the idea for how this would work is is that you have technological change that creates high demand for some occupations and then low demand for other occupations and so that will increase the wages of occupations that where demand grew as a result of technological change and shrank the wages where demand dropped as a result of technological change. So you should see in a scatter plot, if this is a, is a, is a, is a key driver of inequality, you should see that strong relationship where occupations that saw, you know, a, a big growth would also see higher wages, higher wage growth. Um, that would, that would be like an absolute, like, base level, does this theory pass the smell test kind right. of test? And that scatter plot looks like a cloud. You oh. do not see a relationship between the like size of growth by occupation and wage growth within that occupation. It's just a cloud. And so it just doesn't really hold the smell. What, what you see is that wage, wages have... Um, inequality has really a ton of it has happened within occupations so it's just um it just doesn't it mm. just doesn't is that, that can view I ask, just is, doesn't really hold up to the data is that is do you is that a consensus view what you just expressed or is that i i think that a it, is, view? it is a growing view because there's been growing empirical view. work coming out showing that that there's real problems with skill bias that like david card um, yeah. you know, Nobel Prize winner will, you know, has said this this theory just doesn't really hold up to the data, but it is such an entrenched view amongst economists that except for the people who have really are really focused in on it, it it, it had been conventional wisdom for so long. I think that the conventional wisdom piece of this is still being eaten away at. Um, but it is it is. I, I truly believe that for those who are look, look closely at the data, it just 
it just sort of disappears. Yeah. And what's the explanation for that? How do you, why doesn't that work? I think it is um, that uh, it's these other forces that are really what's driving inequality. Like when you see the the increase in the, you know, the call it the the gap between college workers with a college degree and workers without a college degree people will say well that's because of you know return higher returns to college i mean the college wage premium has not been rising for a very long time now but you know in the 80s 90s it was rising um it was the exact same time that unions were taking a big hit right and those hit the same things that hit workers with low you know without a college degree so it wasn't about them, the 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 technology creating the higher returns to college. It was about the institution of unionization declining that undermined the wages of workers without a college degree. It was about globalization undermining the wages of workers without a college degree, not technological change that boosted the wages of workers with a college degree. Hmm. Chris, what's your what, do you have any view on this? Any do you want to push back in any way? I, I would tend to disagree. I think. Well, I would. I would See, agree. this is what Chris does. He yeah, he, that's he, fair. <laughs> I would agree with. He this does statement. this all the time, Heidi. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would agree with the statement that there's there's a lot of things happening simultaneously, right? Yeah. So all of these factors were occurring all at the same time: globalization, declining immunization, you know, technological changes, taxes. I, I I'm surprised we didn't include tax, but I guess we're focusing just on the gross, but. I think, to my mind, taxes and transfers are at the top of the list. We Inequality, to some extent, is a choice. We could redesign our tax system, redesign our transfer system to eliminate or re- sharply reduce inequality if we wanted to. So, uh, which, is, again, which is, if you go look in Europe, where the, the tax code is more redistributive, the inequality is lower, at least by the measures yeah, that we look yeah. at. To your point. Now, certainly, your if point. you want to, you know, there's a, I'm not saying it's a simple way, but it's a very direct way if you it, it, really it's not a comment on whether it's good or bad. It's just right. that's a, a fact. Mechanically, right? it's possible. Yeah. 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 And there are trade offs. We, you know, so, so, as a society, we've decided that the, the level of inequality presumably is consistent with the, the trade offs we're making for growth or other aspects. That's certainly debatable, but uh, I see that as you know, certainly a lever in our control. I, I do believe, though, that the technological change is certainly part of the equation. And I, I wouldn't say it's a insignificant piece. Um, my own work, one key aspect is that there, I find that there are long lags between technological innovations and how the labor market adjusts, right? You have to have businesses uh, adopting technologies, figuring out the best way to use them. You need workers to adjust, you know, realize that there is this demand, that they need certain skills. So I think I think you'll see that cloud perhaps, but once you start to control or pick it apart, you can see certainly some aspects of it. I'm not saying that technology is the only thing, but I wouldn't say it's it's irrelevant either. I think there are it certainly has that aspect. I think we could go through anecdotes, certainly, uh historically, of um, you know, going from typing to uh use of computers. Clearly there was a a factor, a shift there in terms of the returns to certain skills that, you know. Have, yeah. to, have to make a difference, but uh... techno. I am in total agreement that technology changes the way work gets done. Like a hundred percent, it will it will change the mix of jobs. Um, I just don't see it as being a driving factor. Of it, it's kind of it. It, it has happened, it, you know, in such variety of ways and all different things. It's just not driving. I, I believe it's not driving. The, I believe the data show it's not driving these core trends. What about AI, Heidi? Well, any You feel the same way about AI? I am, AI artificial intelligence. There's a lot of hand wringing about that. What yeah, that there mean? sure is. There's a lot of breathlessness. I um And my ex- I just want to say before I say anything about AI that I do not have any expertise on what I, you know, the impact of AI might be on 
national security or on democracy or on, you know, like the, there's a well, lot that never of stopped us from talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, so, you know, but free. I don't have, yeah. I don't know. Like those things do sound, you know, those potential yeah, problems in those scary. areas yeah. sound a yeah. little, you know, yeah. I could, I could get myself worked up about those things without having a ton of expertise, but I do have a ton of expertise on the impact of technology on the labor market. And one thing I think we all need to step back and realize is that technology is on net good for workers. Like it, technology led yeah. productivity growth actually is the thing that makes it possible for wages to grow. And even though over the last 40 years, we, it, you know, workers haven't gotten their quote unquote fair share of productivity growth because of, you know, I, you know, with the things we were just talking about, uh, too high unemployment and, and globalization and, and un decline of unionization, they, they've gotten some like that is, it is the thing that makes it possible for living standards to rise over time. So I am actually, the idea of a AI led productivity surge, I, I think it's, it's, you know, I don't think we're going to get the massive increases that some are projecting at all, but I'm looking forward to that. Like, I, I think that that's, we want to like those, that kind of growth is a, is a really positive thing. Um, and then you just, how it plays out in individual workplaces, I think really is a matter of who holds the power. And you could see like, like one thing I, I always say, like, there is no way that policymakers can micromanage how AI plays out in individual workplaces. It's just too varied. It just is going to play out differently. Like there's, and so the, the thing that will make it play out in a way that is, that makes sure that workers as well as their employers reap some of the benefits of the productivity growth that happens as a result of AI will be the, the I think a core way to do it is make sure that workers actually have some leverage to be able to negotiate around AI on their own behalf. And you, we mentioned this earlier, but the the right, the screenwriters. It's a perfect example of the Screenwriters Guild actually negotiated a contract last fall that has provisions that protect workers around the use of AI. It allows the use of AI, but it makes sure that AI doesn't undermine um, workers' credit for their for the for the work that they do. So it's like you know they they negotiated together how to have AI play out in their workplaces, and that's the way to make sure that it um, that you know, that that we don't see the replay of the last 40 mm -hmm. years, but instead we see workers actually getting some of their fair share of the, uh, what I hope will be the, you know, AI driven productivity boost. Mm -hmm. I hope we see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's, cause we're, we're, believe it or not, we've been oh, going wow. on yeah. here for more than an hour, but I do want to talk about immigration because that uh, yeah. was also kind of a, feels like a non-conventional perspective that immigration and of course, we've been getting a lot of immigrants coming into the country. Yep. Uh, I mean, the CBO came out with a study recently showing or estimating that the 3.3 million immigrants, legal and undocumented, came into the country in 2023, on top of, I think, 2.6 million. The year. Typically, it's about a million. And it surged. A lot of that's what's happening at the border. Uh, and there's a lot of, again, hand-wringing about what that might mean for you know, workers, uh, it, the, the hand wringing has been less pronounced just because the labor market has been so tight. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, right? it's been more a plus than a, a minus, at least with regard to what it means for the labor market and monetary policy. But, but none, nonetheless, there's the, I think the conventional wisdom is that immigration helps to skew income, uh, the distribution of income, but you say no. It's it, like this mechanically it can um, because, you know, we talked about this, but immigrants themselves enter the country in a very bimodal way. Like there's work immigrants come in with very high levels of education and with very low levels of education. And obviously immigration happens all across the education distribution. But you do see this more bimodal entrant entry than you do for the U.S. born population. And so that mechanically raises inequality. But I don't. But aside from that, it's not a big factor. Um, the as far as job growth go, I mean, right now, native U.S. born. I say keep saying native born population because that's those are words that BLS uses, and I like to. I think U.S. born is a is a better. Term oh, is that? Oh, okay. That I should yeah, say that's US why I, I always have to translate from what I'm reading oh, okay. in the data to then okay. what I actually want to say when Good I speak know. it out loud. Um, the the um, 
you know, the U.S. born unemployment rates are at near record lows. Like we are just this this labor market is really strong. It's absorbing lots of immigrants and keeping just incredibly low unemployment rates for U.S. born workers at the same time. Um, but then but the question, I think, comes down to wages. And there is a lot of work on this. The most recent, like comprehensive thing is the National Academy of Sciences did a big study in 2017, like really going over all of the evidence on the impact of of immigration on wages. And the biggest imp the, the, the impacts aren't big, period. They're just it's not a big driver. But the biggest impacts are on earlier immigrants. So it is immig immigrants come in and they are more likely to do the jobs that pe that the people in them are all right are immigrants themselves. And so the biggest negative impacts are on earlier immigrants. And there are some negative impacts on um, US born workers without a high school degree. Uh, and that is a not that we, we should think about that obviously the economic outcomes of us workers without a high school degree but it is a very small share of our labor force it's something like 6% right now so it's uh it's just doesn't and and other than that there's just not a there's just not a a big a big impact except on earlier immigrants hmm. marissa Kirsten, you want to push back on any of that marissa no sorry uh no no i don't no. think so okay. um yeah, I, I was reading a paper that Brookings did the other day on this recent surge in immigration, mm -hmm. and one Wendy really, at the Hamilton yeah, project. Yeah, one thing I I was really interested to see is they looked at different cohorts of immigrants into the country and what their labor force participation is, like two years on after arriving, and the most recent cohorts of immigrants mm -hmm. have a much higher participation rate than any immigrants that have come in in like the past 10 years. So there was sort of this dip. And then the immigrants that are coming in now are much more likely to participate in the labor force. So it is it, it is interesting when we talk mm -hmm. about labor force growth, right, Mark? We talk about this a lot when we see the BLS numbers and how is there all this labor supply? There's way more labor supply out there than we would have thought. And, and this goes to that explanation. And they're also more likely to participate. Well, I think yeah. Which makes... is doing a service to the economy. Totally. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, yes, it this is. has actually been a benefit yeah, it sure to your has. point, Heidi, not taking away jobs, but just adding to the supply of labor in a very tight market where employers are scraping in some industries to find people. Right. Like immigrants obviously add to both the supply side and the demand side mm -hmm. like that. And so, sometimes I think when people say immigrants are taking all our job, they, that, that, that there's this forgetting there. Also, come in and buy stuff and create more jobs as a result. So, but right. they add more to the supply side because they're relatively more likely to work than the, than the U S born population. And so it really has helped, um, with, uh, with, uh, with our supply the, side issues. Yeah. The other thing that people forget is that immigrants, uh, they're risk takers by definition, right? You don't pick yeah. up and leave one place with your family and go to another place and have no idea where you're going unless you're a risk taker. So you start companies at a higher rate, yep. you're more entrepreneurial, more create, more innovative. And, and, and there's evidence um, that a strong statistical evidence that immigration leads to higher rates of productivity. So it's not just about the, 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 the people, the workers, it's about and go go take a look at you know these tech companies that are driving a lot of the productivity gains. You know they they are many of them uh, have many immigrants and are led by immigrants. You know the 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 uh, CEOs and the the C suite of these companies are are, are immigrants. So uh, interesting point. So I I kind of created a frame for thinking about how income inequality was create. You know how we got here and why the the uh the distribution become more uh become more skewed okay very quickly because i know we're, we're going to lose marissa in just a few minutes she's off to her skiing vacation and my uh, flight's and... delayed like 45 minutes so. oh there you go okay okay <laughs> oh, i'm probably uh, gonna miss my connection but fine. Uh, okay uh <laughs> so we can keep going is what you're right well, might as well uh, i'm sure heidi's gonna be saying what about lunch <laughs> don't you guys eat lunch uh, um uh what does it mean for the future 
what do you think? I mean, because you put it number one, uh, high unemployment. Well, problem solved. <laughs> I mean, at least for the foreseeable future, no problem. Unionization feels like, you know, we've turned the corner there, certainly with regard to the attitudes. I don't know that we're going to see a large yeah. increase in the share, but I don't think we're going to see declines here in the near future. You said immigration doesn't really matter. You said technology really doesn't matter. Trade, uh, yeah, we're deglobalizing, so that's going to be less of an issue. Um, and then I guess it leaves you know labor laws and regulation, but that's not changing fast. So I don't know if that changes the dynamics here to a significant degree. But I'm putting, I don't want to mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm just saying if I take the equation we just estimated and put in right hand side variables, I'm, I'm it feels better to me going forward. It feels like okay, yep. It is weird in this in this world where so much feels difficult. Um, this is one, it is an area of I feel optimistic about okay, the great. future. The one thing on unionization um, that is tricky is even with all of the momentum, it is going to take labor law reform to really halt and reverse those trends of declining unionization. Like the deck is so unbelievably stacked against unionization. And I can give you just one example as color to, mm -hmm. around this. Um, it is technically illegal under our labor law to fire somebody for union activity. Like that is a core part of US labor law. And it nevertheless, nevertheless happens all the time because mm -hmm. the consequences to employers of firing somebody for union activity are like a slap on the wrist if that the worst that can happen to them is that they will have to reinstate if you know if they go through the whole process and are found to have illegally fired a worker for union organizing or union activity the worst that can happen to them is that they have to reinstate that worker give them their back wages minus any wages they earned at a different job in the meantime it is just a mm -hmm. uh, nothing burger and that is symbolic of how the how labor law is just like just relentless attacks have absolutely it's just it just doesn't i mean this is the thing where you know there's this massive gap between the share of workers who are in a union and the share of workers who report that they want to be in a union and that gap is policy not actually truly protecting workers rights to unionize so there is a uh, the the momentum is incredibly important. I think it will make a difference, but it's going to take labor law reform, which is going to take a functional Congress to to really do. So that is you. you we all know the um, the sort of obstacles to that in the future. Well, so that's one thing that we know. OK, we got work to do on that front. Well, I have to say if you're leading the charge in terms of making uh, getting Congress moving in the right direction. We're in good shape. So I, I feel even more optimistic that you're on the case. <laughs> okay. So that's that's good. Um, okay. I think um, we took our fair share of uh, t Heidi's time. Uh, anything else, Marissa, Chris, you want, want to say? No? Okay. Yeah, hey, Heidi. Yeah, really, really no, thank you. fascinating. Uh, fascinating it's conversation and really appreciate you coming on to Inside Economics. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And uh, dear listener, uh, that, that means this is the end of the podcast and we'll talk to you next week. Take care now.